when you see something that works, you know it. Yeah, I didn't get enough marks to get into art school. No, to get, I wanted to do design at Kofa. Yeah. And I didn't get enough marks to, I wasn't smart enough to, what, like, get, to what do, was it, do what, the When degree. you finished school, what was it? Uh, 97, I finished. 97, so yeah. it would have been a UAI? Or no, a TER? Uh, yeah. yeah. And you needed a TER in 97? Um, oh, I don't think it was even that. Um, but I then went to, I ended up at Kofa just on a visit and saw these interviews for applied arts and met a great lecturer there. I got like 97% in my interview, but they said, because of the marks, we can't let you in. So I got my second preference, which was Sydney, Sydney College of the Arts in the glass studio. Yep. And that was where I started you know, working with glass. So why glass. glass first? Well, glass, I had watched the glass blowing in Murano on a holiday, family holiday trip to Italy. How and I thought I would have been about 15, I think. Yeah. And even a bit younger. And uh, I knew I wanted to do something three dimensional. I didn't want to do ceramics because I'd, I'd done a lot with my dad in the, in the studio as a kid being a potter. So um, three dimensional and sculpture was, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, not my first choice. It was glass, I think because of that material kind of process kind of, uh, intrigued me. And yeah, so that's when I started the degree there and also started, uh, working at the bronze foundry, bronze casting sculptures for other, other artists. Where, where was the bronze, which, which foundry? No, Crawford's Castings and um, South Strathfield. So, uh, yeah, and the, the glass process I focused on was casting because I was casting at work, casting at, at uni as well. And through that casting process of glass is very restrictive. There are a lot of restrictions working with glass. So that kind of did uh, early on. Chemically? Yeah, you, you can't, yeah, yeah, just... Um, like the fundamentals of glass. Yeah, fundamentals, fundamentals of glass so. only kind of can do a certain... You can only push it so far and then it just doesn't work. Correct. So uh, I always worked within those parameters. And I've, what I've found, I think that's continued in through my whole art practice, is that um, having parameters for what you, what you, how you work are important to kind of get a, a good outcome. So... Uh, I don't, there are no curves in my work. I'm working with straight, straight edges, straight lines. And that's kind of how I started working with glass. Um, and, and also glass being an architectural kind of medium. I, I, my work was very linear and I incorporated concrete and stainless steel into, into those early works. And, uh, and yeah. And then over, over time, and a couple of exhibitions combining glass and metal. Um, I, I kind of realized that um, less linear, so I kind of found a bit more freedom within how I was working material. And, and they've kind of evolved to these, these pieces that are different, quite different in some ways. I, I work directly, when I'm, when I'm creating work, I work directly in three-dimensional form in styrofoam. So I'm cutting up styrofoam. I'm using two kind of processes of one of reduction, where I'm taking material away to create a form. And then secondary, I'm working on a kind of assembling kind of way, where I'm putting forms together to create a, a, create a form that actually works, that I feel, I feel uh, works as a, as a sculpture and and I will uh, I will quite often work on a number of different pieces at the same time because it's it's very kind of uh, intuitive and kind of subconscious the way that I can kind of kind of create these I have no uh, plan of, there's no destination yeah there's yeah it's 
it's of its process. It's of its process, and it and it um, and it just evolves naturally as I kind of get stuck with a piece. I'll move on to something else, and I'll turn it upside down, or I'll take a little bit off there, or add a little bit of styrofoam, and until finally I feel like I've. I feel like there's an end to it and that it's, it's a whole piece and it's something that can kind of sit there and hold its own space. And that, for me, is really important. It's about, it's about a, a sculpture being able to be, hold, its, hold its form and, and, um, and have a presence with, within that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's... Where does the colour come from then? The colours, uh, um, I've found that, I guess, in working with bronze, which is my main, my main medium, mm. um, the, the patinas, I really love that, uh, the surface and the colour of the patinas, but they kind of be quite traditional. So having, being able to apply a, a, a colour um, is it was a great kind of opportunity for that. I kind of it's not really traditionally you wouldn't put a color on a bronze sculpture, but uh, being contemporary art, I feel like it's it's allowed and yeah. and I think it works quite well. Colors, you know, um, it's, there's no particular reason for the colors. I like the you know the I guess the the warm warmer colours uh, fit nicely into the you know heat heat wave exhibition so <laughs> they'll um, yeah yeah they're just some favourite colours yeah when you're deciding on the colour is this a process of do you, do you, I mean do you do you paint them yourselves firstly no no I've got a, a um, professional painter that paints my work and the surface is very important to me you'll notice with these pieces that there's a satin finish to 30% satin um, and that that finish is really important to me because it's uh, absorbing some of that light that you that you would get reflected from something that's a bit glossier so and I like that idea I kind of feel it adds to the the strength of the work and its ability to kind of stand alone. It kind of, um, yeah, something about that surface just having a softer mm. finish. But then I suppose back to the question I was going to ask, which is how do you decide on the tone of colour? Is that something that you work in? Obviously, you're working with the painter on that. But, you know, if I was to paint the walls of my home or my gallery, the gallery downstairs is like you go to the Dulux shop, correct, and you get swatches. Yeah. Is it that you are interlaying, is that you know that it's that yellow versus that yeah. yellow or is it that red versus that? Well, or, or is that something that organically has of a conversation with the painter? Yeah, yeah. I, the outdoor sculpture that I had in Sculpture by the Sea a few years ago, um, I went to my spray painter with a blue t-shirt that I had and I said, can you colour match this? I really like the colour and, 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 the, and the surface. That, so he, he could do that for me. Um, and I guess the, um, yeah, other than that, like it's just, you know, a safety red and a safety yellow. They're just kind of, you know, they're the, the colours if you kind of yeah in the in the catalog yeah 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 <laughs> or no but i was more like in terms of how you adapt that is that is that it's that primary it's going with the actual primary resonance of the color yeah it's not trying to be too fiddly then it's yeah just, yeah yeah it's yeah. instinctual yeah it is it's instinctual it's um it's yeah the red i see and the yellow they're just your, your classic kind of red yeah neutral kind of red kind of colors neutral i don't know but yeah um and i guess also when i'm working in a series if these were all the same color it would be not 
is very interesting yeah. to, to view as a viewer, you know, yeah, sure. coming to view the work. So, yeah. How, much, how do you make the decision about addition size? And what, and what are the addition sizes of yeah, the, these the work are, in heat wave? Yeah, a limited edition of five. I guess um, when I was working at the foundry, a kind of traditional edition number would be nine. I think that's a, that's a traditional number. But for me, I've I've kept it low, just to maintain the unique u- uniqueness of each each piece. Mm. Um, and yeah, I'll do an artist proof of a piece which is. Uh, you know, a different surface or a, a custom surface or a custom colour as well. So, um, yeah, just depending on the size of my work as well, if I've got, I'll do just a one-off if it's like an outdoor, like large, large scale piece. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's how I've kind of come to additions. And in that foundry process is that you will never cast, you'll cast one, at a time, as per the requirement. Yeah. And you cast multiples, but the first two of an edition at any given time. Is that, or is that an organic thing? Uh, I th- it's client's request. They might like to put all of the um, editions through at one time. It'd probably be cheaper to do that. Yep. Um, but yeah, you, usually it's to order. Yep. And yeah. Um, yeah. So they're just, yeah, one at a time. For me, in, in producing my work, it's just, you know, generally one at a time. So taking a step back, the time that you had working, I just realised you're working at Crawford's Castings Hat. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, where did you do your... Anyway, <laughs> I'm a moron, but that's fine. Um, at working, being in the process of, of casting work by other artists, were there influencing factors in the work that you saw there? I mean, are there there sculptors who have gone before you yeah. under the influences of maybe those glass artisans in Italy or the glass work that you'd done previously or your dad as a potter? Are there other artists' work that you had seen that had played yeah, a lot of influencing? Or is it a of striking of, against? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, like, there wasn't a lot of influence it, what was I guess heartening about working there and seeing other people's work is that I there wasn't a lot of work that that I that was very similar to mine in a way so I felt like um, I was seeing a lot of sculpture but kind of felt like I had something within my work that was unique to a, a, a lot of people to a lot of artists there were a couple of artists that that went through Bert Flugelman, who's Australian artist. He, his work would come through every now and then, and I really love his work. And he's got um, sharp lines, his curves. You know, he's an influence in my work mm. as well. Um, and Clement Meadmore as well. A couple of his pieces came through the foundry over the years, and he's he's my my top top artist. I really love his work. Um, so, yeah, that's, yeah, kind of work, work like that, abstract geometric kind of forms. Yes. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the work that we saw through the fam- foundry were um, um, figurative, figurative works. So, yeah. yeah. In working in the styrofoam, really that's that's the that's the foundation that's the genesis point of of working out which of the forms will complement each other yeah i see that there's this unbalanced balance in your work i yeah. don't know whether that's a concept that you ever thought of or, or discussed but in terms of viewing the work i say well it's about taking a form that sits and has this um it's kind of like it's gyroscopic. It feels like it works in together, but then when you stand around and you view the work, it it, it actually counterpoints that. It, yeah. it totally is the opposite, is that it doesn't actually necessarily fit, but that's where the human eye comes to a point where it does does sit in. 
is is that a straightforward um, process? Do you know historically what shapes are naturally going to to bounce off each other, or is it that you some works might take you? You might be working at that stage for a weeks lot, or months or time. Yeah, yeah. A, there's a lot of styrofoam ends up on the floor mm-hmm. when I'm going through that process. It'll be yeah. It, it's and it, and I think because of that, when you see something that works, you know it. You know that's 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 the key mm. and uh that that is a long process of of just turning things around and i guess back to the styrofoam and the constraints within my my art practice i've got a hot wire and i've got a really sharp knife and i can't cut curves with them <laughs> so <laughs> that's where um you're you're a man you have tools for the job. Yeah. And they do that job. Yeah. So why go changing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and that helps me. It helps me kind of to focus because I know that's what I'm dealing with. I don't have to add anything else <laughs> into it. Studio space. Where do you maintain studio space? Uh, I've got a studio in Marrickville that I work from. Yeah. So that's where all of this happens. And, uh, and you, you, but you commute down there because I know that you've recently moved with your family. Yeah, to yeah, just moved to the Blue Mountains. I've been in Sydney for three days at a time working, um, but I am in the middle of um, setting up a home studio up there. So at some point, I'll be moving up there and working. Uh, and yeah, that, that will happen. But I'm finding everything that I need is, is still down here. So mm. and that will take some time. Do you have a community of other artists that you work with who you bounce ideas off? Um, I don't really. My wife's a painter, so she's a really good sounding board for, for my work. Um, and we, we do a lot of discussion about, about forms and, and, and ideas so I guess that's my closest sounding board but I no, not really I've kind of have felt I don't know when when I was working in glass um, and working in the foundry I was you know working in the foundry dealing with artists all the time but um, yeah not really it didn't feel like I was you know, in, in the sculpture kind of realm, I've kind of always felt a bit like on the outside, mm-hmm. in, in a way, I guess, cause when I was working with glass, a bit on the outside of sculpture, because glass in Australia, anyway, isn't, um, isn't a big, big sculptural kind of medium. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've always felt a little bit just on the edge. But, yeah, it's nice to have these little kind of um, entry points into you know, exhibitions and and um, things like that where I can get a bit more feedback on my work, mm. which is always positive. And I know from having met and spent some time in your studio is that it's not only singular sculptural forms that you are toying with as part of your practice. It's yeah. also work that can feature mounted to the wall yeah yeah what's the decision I have about a, a series of extension yeah a body of work been? that uh, essentially traces my solid three-dimensional forms and these become uh, these quite light skeletal kind of forms that catch the shadow and, and light really nicely but I find I find they're a nice balance to this solid heavy work so um yeah they're they're uh, i like kind of just playing with those forms and creating those forms and um again introducing a little bit of color to those forms uh and that's yeah kind of a, a contrast contrast to these heavy heavier solid solid masses and these scale up as well yeah, yeah, these these works scale up. I once well back to, with my process of styrofoam. Sure. 
I, once I've got a form that I'm really happy with, I'll expand that out on paper, tracing each flat shape, and then I'll, I'll go to office works and photocopy it a bit bigger <laughs> to whatever size I think works best. And then that becomes my template for, for um, cutting out a bronze. It becomes your plan. Yeah, this is the plan. Yeah. yeah. And it kind of flat packs back out as I'm welding, cutting and welding to these, these forms. Um, and, and then I can scale quite large. I've, uh, I think the biggest sculpture I've made is 2.3 metres tall. Uh, that just got shipped to the States a few weeks ago. Um, and and was it in the color or was it in the patina? Of the that blue? was the blue. That was the blue one. That that was the blue one that I asked for a color match for my t-shirt. So yeah, that was great. Yeah. Where's it bound for in the US? That's going to Connecticut, um, and yeah, a, a house there. By sea, not air. Yeah, yeah, by sea. Yeah, yeah. That and that whole process is was very long and drawn out. I kind of I haven't. It's the first piece I've sent well large piece internationally so going through that process is quite interesting dealing with shipping and customs and freight and it's yeah as an artist kind of how, you know. do you, how this is a really just straightforward um logistical question how do you package something that's 2.3 meters tall and i imagine has dimensions with and depth yeah. was at about what a 90 centimeters or so yeah it was it was the Trying it, um, triplex sculpture. So this this red form, it, I had to make sure it could fit into a shipping container, and it could fit in if it was laying down on its side. So I had to design and weld up a a steel trolley for it to lay lie down on with wheels, and and then they crate it up in a box, and yeah, kind of get it. Will you will you go to Connecticut for delivery? Um, oh, for install? Yeah, I would love to, but I think uh, with four kids <laughs> and a wife, I don't, I don't know if I'll get there. I don't know. <laughs> Time, cost, money, people. Yeah, 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 yeah. How old are your children? Uh, my oldest is ten, and then I've got a seven-year-old five-year-old and uh, 18-month-old so yeah it's a full it's a full life <laughs> yeah and three days of work probably yeah probably yeah balances nicely but feels like it's everything's a juggling act. yeah yeah well it's hard like after three days I actually quite miss miss the kids and and you kind of and the little one like um my youngest Mini, she's changing weekly, so I think you'd know about that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, so, but I've only got two. Yeah, and the youngest is the same age, <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, oh, I'm never at home enough. Yeah, it feels. Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah. So the move to to the Blue Mountains was built out of a number of reasons. A bit more oh, space. More space. Yeah. My parents are up there too, so a bit of family support's really good. Yeah. We, we didn't have that down here, so... And just, um, yeah, more space, big backyard. We're on the edge of the National Park. It's wilderness there, so... And we've got birds that come and feed off our hands in the backyard at the back door. And that kind of life for my kids is what I want, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it was... Space is becoming an ever more valuable commodity in Sydney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With four kids. Yeah. Space to run around, I imagine, is becoming is the key thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These kids, the kids can now they just run around. The you know do lap to the house. It's great. Just yeah, yeah. Cool. Mate, we've got some gold in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I'm gonna ask a couple of the very original questions. Yeah. Because I think I got a phone call. Yeah. And I don't know whether it stopped recording for that moment right. or not. Yeah, yeah. What were the first questions that I asked you? Uh, I was talking to you about the glass sculpting. Yeah. How did, yeah, what, how did you know 
How did you know that sculpture was the direction and the path that you wanted to take? Uh, I get it evolved into it evolved from uh, my my study. Well, I, you know, I think wanting to do wanting to be creative and um, wanting to be doing oh, I don't know like. Kind of creativity you wanted to pour out of you. Yeah. Is that something that you knew really early on? I always loved making things, making things out of, in, with my hands. And I love the idea of, um, I love the idea of turning one thing, essentially a, a worthless thing, into something that's got worth. Like, not necessarily financial worth, but uh, a worth in that I've created it with, you know, with the ideas in my head and, and can turn it into something that's precious yeah. and special. Yeah. And of its own value. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that kind of thing is then forever. Like the, the sculptures, you know, they're, they're forever. Bronze is archival. It's, you know, it, the things that I'm making, are going to be here f for ever to come. Yeah. So They're still digging things out of the ground from the Bronze Age, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that idea. Uh, yeah, I like that idea of um, creation, and yeah. When you say that you used to like making things out of your hands, is that a case because your father as a potter? Did you spend time in the studio with your dad? Yeah, my earliest memories are of of mucking around with clay in in his studio, and um, yeah, um, yeah, working with the clay, working with its process, and and um, just seeing. I, I was always amazed that my dad was a production potter, so he he could make a hundred mugs exactly the same and I've just I've re it took it was when I was older that I could actually really appreciate what he did what he could do yeah. and and uh, and you know for a long time and a living from doing that so uh, that idea of again turning a, a lump of clay into something that's um, people use and appreciate oh, yeah. So, yeah that's that idea I really liked. And I guess in terms of, you know, this, my sculpture practice and how it's evolved, it was, it was that uh, initial study, study of glass and, and material. And, and just being true, I guess there was a point where I stopped, I stopped working with glass and just started working with metal. And that was where my, my work, um, became a lot less architectural and became uh, more about geometric abstraction mm -hmm. and and exploring those forms like it's a kind of pure pure form kind of base work mm -hmm. it's um, yeah and and the material um, again I guess informs my work in that I'm using sheets of bronze and you know get cutting that up it's all flat straight till I kind of put it together where do you source bronze from um, there's a, a place in Sydney brass and copper they they bring it up from Melbourne and Melbourne brings it in from the States I'm kind of it's been a bit of a problem with my work because a few years ago, I could buy quite large sheets of bronze, and now they've half the size of the sheets of bronze. So the same money. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, not no, as just, much. Yeah. Just the, the size and scale of bringing yeah, things in. Yeah. Yeah. The bronze is expensive and keeps going up as copper prices go up, yeah. and so yeah, there is quite an expense in working with with bronze, mm -hmm. but now I'm restricted by my sheet size, so it's uh, yeah. It's kind of 
can be a problem. So then large scale works, large format works at 2.3 tall. Yeah. Are they accommodated for in that sheet size? I'll or make them, I'll make the large scale works out of steel. Your R is Yeah. Because yes. bronze is just you can't, can't get the sheet can't size. Can't get the now. sheet size. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And archivally, is there a difference in the steel versus the bronze then? Um, I, there is because eventually... Two different compounds. Yeah, yeah. The bronze, steel will rust away. But I haven't... My, my sculptures are, are painted with um, lots of different things to yeah, correct. stop that happening. Yeah, to cease that. Yeah, yeah. Elemental corrosion. Yeah, yeah. But and I imagine the paint then holds all of that in. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the paint becomes a really important part of that archival process. Yeah. And so, yeah, that is really important. 